Hi, this is Elliot Fishman. And those of you who thought I wasn't going to get a haircut, I got a haircut. So anyway, uh, let me say hi. Those are my grandchildren, Sam and Max. There's pictures in the back there. Um, just want to uh, hope everyone's doing well. We're in the uh, middle of June almost, June 7th or 8th today. And um, hope everyone's doing well. It's that transition time uh, between the residents and fellows leaving and the residents and fellows starting. New faculty coming on board. We've had some new faculty join us a week ago, another faculty is joining us uh, in June, another person mid-July, another person August 1st, another person September 15th, another person October 1st. Um, losing a few people, but we've recruited a bunch of people for diagnostics, so hopefully we'll be in better shape next year than we are currently now. Um, and I think everyone's going through the same thing, right? Staffing is tight and the work is there. Which brings me to the topic of today, misdiagnosis uh, or errors in diagnosis. And I'm giving a talk, and I've spoken about that before. If you go to CTSS, if you go to our app on the Apple Store, or you go to YouTube, we're on YouTube, go to YouTube, um, you'll see all our lectures. And I put together a new series of lectures on misdiagnosis and pitfalls, which I started recording the past couple of days. And it will be available on CTSS, I think, in September, roughly. But I am speaking about that at the University of Pennsylvania meeting. And uh, this is a meeting uh, U of Penn I speak about every three years. They're kind enough to invite me. And this was, I was supposed to give this, these talks in June in J June, 2020, then re-invited June 2021. Then you know the story, June 2022. So hopefully it's going to happen in Martha's Vineyard. So it should be great. And I was preparing my talk and uh, you know, getting everything set up. And then when I finished the talk and started looking at it, I added another slide. And this is the slide right after my title. So it's really essentially the first slide of the talk. And I said, you know, the problem with misdiagnosis, you have to rethink it in the COVID era. What do I mean by that? In the beginning of COVID, remember our protocols were cut back, right? You were afraid to get near the patients. You didn't give the patients oral contrast because they had to take their mask off. Nobody wanted to take their mask off. You didn't want to take the patient's mask off. The patients didn't want to take their mask off. So you cut back on the protocols. You could give IV contrast. We did that. We cut back a lot of the oral. Of course, then you fast forward, and we don't have any oral contrast or IV contrast because of uh, the shortages because of COVID in China and Shanghai. Um, now that's uh, resolving. G is doing a good job flying the contrast over. They're back at full production. So that'll be only a small blip. But also, everyone at first was not very busy sitting around the first few months of COVID. And then after that, the, the floodgates have opened. Everyone is busier than ever. Some people retired because of COVID or just because they were going to retire and COVID moved it up a bit. So people are busier than ever. The volumes are high. So you're doing more than ever. We know articles have been published, but you don't need to have an article to tell you this. The more studies you read, the more misses you have. Everyone would agree if you read faster, you don't make less errors, you make more errors. So there's all of these forces coming into play. And the other thing is, in the COVID era, or the pre-COVID era, you have gone to one or two meetings a year you would have stayed on top of things. And yes, you've been to meetings to get your CME and it was Zoom. And in the beginning, the Zoom was good. But I think we're in Zoom now. I think Zoom is great. I'm about to give conference at 12 o'clock for our faculty, fellows, residents, my case conference. I did that in person for more than a decade. You get the faculty, about 12 people in diagnostic would come because some people are remote, some people are in different buildings, some people are off, some people are on late shift, early shift, whatever. Now we have 35 to 40 people every single week. And if I wanted to change it back to the way it was, people have said, don't do it because this way when I'm in the reading room or I'm at Green Spring Station, which is 10 miles away, or Columbia, which is 20 miles away, I can listen in or people like Sheila Sheth in New York can listen in or Stephanie Copey in Washington can listen in. And people who are off or coming on the shift, the night shift can listen in. So there's certain things that are okay, but the reality is, is you went to less meetings. I think when you listen at times to a lecture on CT is on, not CT is us, on uh, from other places, 
you know, you're sitting in front of your computer, you're twiddling around, you're going to drink some of your vitamin water, you're going to look at your emails because you can, you have a big monitor and you just zoom to smaller and then you could read your emails, you can crop slides, you can do a thousand things, but listening, when you're in a room with people and everyone's listening, you're listening. It's the same reason, not that I ever go to the movies, but I always enjoyed movies in the movie theater because then it's two hours of focus. You're not looking at your cell phone. People scream at you if you try. I've tried. You're eating popcorn maybe, but you're not getting up. I got to get a drink. I got to get a couple crackers. I got to go to the bathroom. I got to check my email. I got to do this, that, and the other. You're fully engaged when you watch a movie. Forget the fact that it's also the big screen, the sound. But as you with 100 or 200 people, which is, you know, COVID, forget that. But people would laugh. So you'd laugh with them and you'd laugh against them. They'd be the, oh, the this, the that, the humanity of it all, you know, was a big difference. Okay. Now, I think that becomes very critical. When you're in a meeting, everyone's listening. You're talking about it outside. You have questions you can ask. You're engaged. You know why you travel to Orlando or to, Florida, or to uh, California or Arizona or, or New York or any place in between. You know what you're doing for dinner. You really are focused on what you're doing. I think it's hard to do that when you're having lectures. So I think this composite of things has made things very, very difficult. Now, I'm just looking at comments so you can comment and I'll read it. There's a comment of, from a person who's in... Bin Don Hospital in Vien, so I'm sure he means Vietnam. Um, so that's one thing is obviously um, I could not be giving a talk in Vietnam today. Uh, it's, a long, it's a long way away. Uh, and, and here's another person from Lodz, Poland. So one of the things, of course, so people are giving me, going to contradict me, right? No, but they're right. I mean, one of the things we can do with YouTube, and we are putting a lot of effort into YouTube we have almost 40,000 people who've registered for our YouTube account. We have thousands of lectures. We're building up specific talks. I'm doing YouTube Live. I used to do Facebook Live only. Now we're doing YouTube. We're really going to build it up. Lily is pushing me to help build YouTube, and we are going to do that. But the fact is that the fact that I'm speaking to you from downtown Baltimore to people in Vietnam and people in Poland shows you the advantage of things like Zoom or just the web itself. There's no great brilliance about that. We understand that it's a great equalizer of being able to share information. So I think we're very, very happy to do that. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I think there is still something people from Lodz, Poland or Vietnam would often go to the ECR, the European College of Radiology, which, used, which is still had in, held in Vienna. And I noticed that, and I've been there a few times, it was always Vienna in March, which is, you know, not the greatest weather in the world. But now it's Vienna in July, which I'm sure is a lot nicer place to be. So there are uh, there are certain advantages. But I think for us, um, you know, with misdiagnosis, let's go to that now. Yesterday, we had pancreatic conference. I do pancreas conference times two on Tuesday, two for Tuesday. One is at 11 o'clock to 12 we look at the new patients that come in, anywhere between eight and 12 patients that come in and are being evaluated for second opinion or first opinion. And we're all there, radiology, pathology, medical oncology, surgical oncology, we're all the radiation therapy. We're all there making decisions what's best for the patient. We then have a second meeting at four to five where I look at between 10 and 20 cases of patients who are undergoing therapy. Maybe they got their follow-up scans. Maybe the surgeon, the oncologist has a question about a scan or something, or they want to discuss it. So I do that as well. Yesterday, we had eight cases. Four of the cases, when I look back at the outside scans, the patients all presented with something like vague abdominal pain. But in three or four cases, surely in at least three of them, the diagnosis was there four to six months before, and it was missed. Interestingly, it was read as no mass, but the patients had a dilated pancreatic duct and it wasn't like a three millimeter duct. It was more like six or seven millimeters. And the duct came across to the body of the pancreas and it stopped. It was obviously a duct cutoff sign. The most pancreatic cancer, 
is at 8% survival five years. But if you're stage one, it's 70%. There was just an article in AJR from Japan about that, okay? No one's arguing those numbers. So the key is early detection. One of the reasons we're doing AI is for early detection of pancreatic cancer. But the truth of the matter is you, all of us, need to be monitoring early detection of pancreatic cancer. If we see... If we see somebody, um, if we see somebody with a dilated duct and there's abrupt duct cutoff, we need to pay attention and say suspicious for mass. Okay, should you get an MR? Dr. Cameron would say, don't bother, just go right to EUS. EUS will find the lesion. In fact, Dr. Cameron used to say, just go right to surgery because the truth is, when there's an abrupt duct cutoff, 99% of the time it's going to be a tumor. So that indeed becomes very important. You need to be paying attention to those signs. And both of the, all the cases, it was missed. The patient's tumor progressed, and the three patients, none of them were resectable. Now, you can argue five months, six months, would it have made a difference? It might have. Early detection is everything. So misdiagnosis. Do not miss a dilated pancreatic duct. If you see a duct but don't see a mass, there's something there. Occasionally, it's a neuroendocrine tumor, and yes, occasionally, you can get chronic pancreatitis, but it doesn't have that abrupt kind of cutoff. It looks different, and the fact is, if you don't see changes of chronic pancreatitis, you better get EUS because there's a tumor there. So again, that's a misdiagnosis. There's no reason you should miss that. Another thing, IV contrast is critical in looking at the pancreas. Textural changes are best seen when looking at lack of enhancement, areas of decreased attenuation. Now, um, that's my daughter calling me, I'll have to call her back. But um, it's, this, it's this lack of attenuation. Now, in this crisis of contrast, people are now gonna have four to six weeks of low contrast volumes or not giving contrast at all. So I'm saying to you is, we need to give IV contrast if you suspect a pancreatic mass, you need dual phase study. But even if you have a single phase, look very carefully. Very, very important. We don't want to make mistakes. So in terms of pancreas, that is one of the most critical areas. Now, I think what I'm going to do is perhaps stop there. And what I'll do is I'll do a series of just these short talks, maybe even shorter. This is going to be 13 minutes. But I'll do maybe these three to five minute talks talking about specific areas of misdiagnosis. So this one will be pancreatic duct cutoff as a tumor present to prove it otherwise. And with that, I hope to see you on YouTube. We hope to see you on CTSS, the website, our lectures, all our cases, our lots of cutoffs. And I'll say hi again to our friends in Vietnam and Poland and everybody else who didn't tell me where they are. Uh, we thank you for being here and have a great day.